Hi, everybody, and welcome to Experian Talks. And in this episode, Experian Talks supporting victims of modern slavery and economic abuse. And I'm really happy to be joined by Laura from Hope for Justice. And um, today, Laura is going to help us understand what modern slavery is. And we're going to talk a little bit about economic abuse and how being a victim of modern slavery can impact um, your credit report and how you know we can help rehabilitate people's financial lives after they've become a victim. And also some of the great work that Laura and the team do there. So uh, Laura, thanks for joining. Um, really pleased to have you. Uh, so um, do you want to do a quick intro and, and then we can hear a bit about what you do at Hope for Justice? Yeah, great. So my name is Laura Gautry. I'm an independent modern slavery advocate and social worker at Hope for Justice. So Hope for Justice is an anti-modern slavery charity. We work across five continents and in the UK, we work to prevent exploitation through training and community outreach. Um, we also identify victims of modern slavery and, and help people out of that exploitation. Um, we help people then to rebuild after they've been exploited. Um, and then we help in terms of using our frontline uh, experience from uh, working directly with victims and survivors in order to inform policy um, and reform to try and see change nationally. Okay, that's a full plate of work you've got. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> excellent. So. There's lots that we're going to talk about. I think one of the things we'll we'll discuss later on is, I guess, the financial rehabilitation part. So we've, you know, Experian have done work with you guys at, at Hope for Justice on how we do that, and we'll we'll touch on that later. But if we take it back to basics, because you know, uh, until a certain point, I think I didn't know, and maybe lots of people don't know um, about this problem necessarily. So if we take it back, what's, I mean, from from your perspective, what is modern slavery? Okay, so most people think slavery is something of the past, a practice that has been abolished. However, it's estimated that there are currently 40.3 million people trapped in slavery globally, um, 136,000 of those in the UK alone. So that would be similar to the population of the city of Preston or the city of Norwich. So still pretty high numbers that I think would you know, be, yeah. be surprising. Um, there's a formal legal definition of modern slavery and human trafficking. However, at its core, it's about exploitation of people for financial gain. And it can take many forms. Most commonly would be forced labor or sexual exploitation. It involves people being forced into a service against their will and Control can be either physical, financial, or psychological. Wow, it's um, scary numbers. I think, particularly in the UK, that's that's a, a a high figure for people. I think maybe people don't understand that the problem is so big as well. So, um, I mean, so I guess it's great work that, that you guys are doing there. But let's. I want to get a bit of an understanding about how someone becomes a victim of modern slavery, because I think people maybe have preconceptions about how that happens. But I guess it happens from a range of different factors or, or issues that people have that maybe um, take them on that journey to being a victim. Absolutely. Yeah. So anyone can become a victim of modern slavery. However, commonly we find that people who are targeted have underlying vulnerabilities. So it might be that um, they're unemployed, they maybe have a learning disability or mental health issue, addiction, um, may have been through the care system, have a lack of support network. The vulnerability could even be that someone is unable to open a bank account and so therefore is unable to secure legitimate employment and therefore targeted and, and taken advantage because of this. Um, often victims are approached offered a chance of a better life, false promises are made, and then the reality is very different. Yeah, that doesn't sound very pleasant. I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here um, in terms of this question, but is there a kind of time frame, an average time frame that someone um, might be at that time a victim of modern slavery before they get help or can be kind of rescued from that situation? It, does that exist? in some way you know is it usually you find victims in there for 
two years, three years? It really varies from my experience. So we've had some victims who have been um, in exploitation for a matter of months, others sort of 10 or 12 years, I think is the longest two, um, that I've personally um, sort of seen from, from working directly with victims. Um, so it, it depends really on sort of how they're, they're kept um, in their the position of exploitation and, and you know who they meet and where their opportunities are you know to leave and, and some people think that, that that is their life and that there's there's no there's no way out so it can almost just become a norm even though it's obviously a horrific um situation yeah yeah that doesn't that does sound horrific i mean so i mean you've really done you've done a good job taking us through the scale of the problem in the uk um and hopefully this is a bit of an eye-opener as it is for as it was for me when i first learned about that but hope for justice um you know you're set up to support victims so how do you roughly do that in a kind of in a nutshell how do you find victims and then how do you support them through the process of rehabilitating their lives and and i guess getting back out to live free lives yeah so there's a couple of ways that this happens in the uk um, so firstly, we have community engagement hubs whose focus is victim identification and building community resilience. So we have hubs in the in West Yorkshire, East Midlands, and we're soon to have a hub in the Northwest. So the hubs have outreach workers who speak different languages, which enable them to access communities who are at risk build that trust and, and rapport with, with people um, and just get into some of those places that can be quite closed and hard to reach um, because often that's sort of where where victims are, where, you know, kind of maybe um, they don't speak English, maybe they um, are told that sort of authorities in the UK are corrupt and they can't tell the police or, you know, that something bad will happen to them and they're sort of fed these lies. So our community outreach workers will be able to almost just become you know integrated into these communities to to try and work out what, what's happening there um and if there is um exploitation found they will facilitate referrals into the national referral mechanism which is the government system to officially recognize victims and as part of that the victims will receive um safe house accommodation and subsistence allowance um, for kind of a limited period of time um, and then we also have an advocacy team which is I'm part of um, so our independent modern slavery advocates work with survivors once they um, come out of exploitation we help um, survivors to access legal advice and the support needed for them to rebuild so sometimes people can need sort of up to five different solicitors working on their case because of what's happened during their exploitation. It can be really quite complex for them to try and understand those systems and, and to navigate them. Um, and also we know that sort of criminal justice systems and civil processes can take years. So, we, we, you know, we can see sort of cases taking years to get to court. Um, so we want to be able to work with people sort of through that, that process to secure, you know, the, the outcomes that are needed. And, you know help people to rebuild in whatever way they you know wish to do so yeah it's it sounds um yeah it does sound complex and i guess they come to you with lots of lots of issues and one of the one of them that i think we that we're going to talk about and we'll get on to now actually is around the financial aspect so you know experience of help support um hope for justice and working with hope for justice to support victims of economic abuse but We'll get into that in a second, but I guess from the from the outset, do victims often come, uh, you know, through hope for justice with financial problems? And and I guess we, could we limit that to economic abuse, or do they come with other sorts of financial problems? You mentioned earlier about struggling to open a bank account, for example. But um, is there a range of things that they have or tend to come with? Yeah, so we find that traffickers typically want to exploit victims in as many ways as possible in order to maximize their gain and um, so it's common during exploitation that id taken from victims and then loans are taken out benefit fraud utility debt money laundering might have several bank accounts in their name that they weren't aware of um, so then when the victim escapes exploitation they don't necessarily know what their id was used for um, and they're left with huge debt, poor credit score, 
um, and they have difficulty accessing financial services. We've also seen at times victims have been made to sign for loans, which can then be difficult to dispute later as it appears that they've given their consent, although this was under duress. So, yeah, it, the financial abuse takes many forms um, and can be quite complex to try and sort of get to the bottom of and, um, yeah, help people to, to have access to financial services again. Yeah, that's that's quite a complicated range of, of problems I think they could arrive with. One of them, you know, we talk about economic abuse uh, in terms of, I guess, an umbrella term for lots of different issues. But the one that I think we should talk about is um, is is what we've mentioned just now. So economic abuse in terms of someone opening accounts in your name that you have no knowledge of. Now, I think that's quite normal for people to think of economic abuse in that sense, because it's very much, um, I guess, typical um, fraudulent activity, which is where someone has taken your information and opened up credit accounts in your name. But the other one you mentioned there, which is about um, being coerced into opening accounts. And I guess you find probably victims um, are often in that case where they've been coerced um, to open up credit accounts in their name, which then can prove a little bit difficult to dispute and to query and to get lenders to um, to remove. I mean, I guess you find that problem as well. It's quite tricky for Hope for Justice to investigate as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes it's about finding out who the debt is with, um, which is obviously one of the main things that we'll speak about um, today. So, so that could be a, a major issue. Um, and then also when we're contacting creditors or you know debt agencies and they're saying, well, this person signed for this um, loan, so they must have you know understood it. Um, those agencies often don't understand modern slavery and so they're looking at it very kind of in a clear-cut way when actually mm. the situation is much more complex. Yeah, I think one of the things that we've spoken about before as well is definitely around the barriers that, I mean, particularly like language barriers. And yeah. one of the cases that you highlighted to me, which I you know, hadn't thought about before, was that um, you know, people are sometimes taken to outlets you know shops banks wherever and forced to open agreements with someone who kind of is acting as a, a translator but is really kind of a handler excuse my terms for these i'm just uh, making these up as i go but you know kind of being forced to open credit by someone then i guess people just aren't aware that that kind of thing goes on yeah absolutely so we have been doing some work with different banks around this because there have been certain banks that have been really targeted sort of quite harshly on this um, and you know money laundered through accounts um, and so we have been working with banks about what signs to look out for in branch and just advising that they should be using interpreters or if the person is saying that they're interpreter make sure that they have an ID that they're registered or you know to speak with the the person who wants to open the account separate from the person who's brought them in um, so just sort of advising that, that banks should really be doing their own checks as well, not just taking things on, on face value. Just out of interest, if anyone, if anyone finds themselves in a situation where, I don't know, they're just working in, in a shop, for example, and they, or a bank, and they see that scenario, do, do these companies have processes for raising the alarm, so to speak? Or is that somewhere people should go or notify if they find that? I mean, would it be contacting the police or would it be doing something else that is best yeah. practice? Yeah, so I think it depends on um, kind of the organisation, really, if they've had any training, if they're aware mm. of modern slavery as to whether they would have developed the process. Um, I mean, every business should now be aware through the, the modern slavery act. You know, they have to make modern slavery statement. They have to show that they've considered um, their supply chains and um and sometimes as part of that they might do training for staff um i think if it's an emergency and if it seems like a you know there's an imminent concern then definitely a 999 call or if it's more just kind of a bit unsure it could be sort of 101 call to a local police um station and um then also there is a, a modern slavery helpline like a national helpline that mm -hmm. anyone can call 24 7 um, but also hope for justice are happy to be contacted 
if there's you know sort of concerns and you want to just sort of run something by us um and yeah we're, we'd be happy to look into that or or provide any advice also on our website we have spot the signs posters and information sort of in different languages as well if anyone wanted to you know Great. look see what they were looking out for or yeah just make kind of people aware you know who maybe don't speak english as well yeah, great. That sounds super. So um, uh, since you've mentioned it, we'll put links, by the way, in the um, in the description as well. So let's talk a bit about uh, the financial rehabilitation. So we've worked, you know, Experian have worked with Hope for Justice now to set up a process. And I think this came with the, I guess, the complexities of the cases you handle. Um, so I'll explain briefly how the process works, because um, we'll work now with Hope for Justice on, on a couple of things. Now, the first is to make sure that people can access their credit reports. And the first challenge we had here, um, which I guess you see, is that victims can often come to you um, or refer to you with very few documents or ID or um, knowledge. I think you mentioned this already, knowledge about where they've lived or where they've stayed. So I guess that part proves very tricky in terms of doing a financial assessment mm -hmm. of someone and to particularly getting hold of their credit reports. Yeah. Um, so I think the first thing we did was set up a process whereby, you know, we could we could uh, in a more easier and um, and structured way, let people access their credit report data, because the first thing we want to be able to allow people to do is see what credit is taken out in their name so that they can see whether they have been a victim of fraud. So a, a victim of economic abuse, and then they can get an idea of addresses they've lived at and connected to. Um, so I guess that was the first hurdle that we came through. So I guess, I mean, from your perspective, from a Hope for Justice perspective, I guess um, that can be quite tricky, that first process in terms of getting hold of financial information, understanding what credit's out in their name and so on, because people probably just don't know what they were taking out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so because the, the victims themselves were often not the people who took out the credit or the loans or um, kind of the, the, you know, the benefit debt, they just wouldn't, um, yeah, know where to even start with, with, with looking at, you know, what might have happened. Um, and it's often only months down the line that they would receive a letter, maybe from a debt collection agency, um, who would say, right, we finally found you, you know, you've moved obviously many addresses and now it's time to pay up, which is, um, you know quite a daunting thing to receive when yeah. you weren't aware of the debt and by that point there's been additional sort of you know costs added and um you know you're at a point when you're just trying to rebuild and then this is a reminder of everything that's happened um and so it's been great to, to work with Experian because i think you've really recognized the the barriers that um survivors face in in having access to finance and understanding what's happened fraudulently in, on, on victims' accounts in, in their names. Um, and so being able to develop this process where we can contact um, Experian directly and to ask for a credit report done so that then we can see exactly um, what debt has occurred, like what credit, um, what's happened to their, their credit rating. Um, and it's all in one place so we can see um, right these are all the different debts these are all you know the, the companies that they're with these are all the amounts and then we can preempt those letters arriving months down the line by contacting those um creditors early and explaining the situation and um looking to kind of get those wiped so that that isn't you know a, a sort of nasty surprise later on yeah and i guess it, that highlights a real issue which is survivors of you know not just modern slavery but economic abuse where um typically they've been forced to open credit in their name or they've had it done without their knowledge or permission um i won't go just just yet into the intricacies of those two because i think um they're a bit trickier in terms of how we dispute them but i guess you know from a from a, a perspective of someone who's recovering and wants to rehabilitate what you could be left with on your credit report at that point in time is probably multiple um accounts which are maybe in a default status which are a kind of a very serious issue on your credit report could be missed payments and it could be high high um 
amounts of outstanding borrowing as well. And it could even have led to court judgments at that point. So I guess, you know, for your the victims that you're supporting, what they're really left with is then being in a position where they might not even be able to access services and credit that they, I mean, deserve to to start yeah. rebuilding their lives. So I guess that's kind of a tricky, a tricky spot. I mean, do you often find actually that victims come out, uh, you know, through your support and then they're just finding it difficult to access basic services because of this? Absolutely. Yeah. So commonly they would try to open a bank account and be told it was declined, but not always given a reason. Um, and also maybe try to take out a mobile phone contract and also told, no, it's not possible. And so trying to work out why it's been declined or you know why they can't have this basic access um originally was quite a challenge because we couldn't get any information from the people who were declining you know these accounts or, or these contracts um so yeah being able to sort of see this early then enables us to do something about yeah. it before you know they, they get those rejections yeah and i think you know definitely from the perspective of someone who suffered this they they have every right to have that information disputed or queried mm -hmm. with the lenders uh, and you know this is where we can talk about the two kind of types the first is impersonation where someone's um opened accounts in their name without their knowledge you know we typically view these just as in the stricter sense as third party fraud so quite typical fraud case um, and, you know, the team at Experian will, you know, happily go away and dispute any of those accounts with the lenders directly to say they're fraudulent. And yeah. the ideal scenario is that, that that information is removed from the credit report completely, which means yeah. that they can kind of set the, re the reset button and, you know, start afresh with their genuine information. But the other part is the coerced accounts, which is a little bit more tricky. And, you know, I think you said it's not quite as clear cut. Um, but of course, I think, you know, again, with those scenarios, victims deserve the right to have those disputed. So Experian can do those. And I think you also do them from your side as well at Hope for Justice, but definitely getting those disputed with lenders. And hopefully lenders are understanding the situation that someone was forced. Um, and I think, as you said, sometimes physically to open up accounts. And I think, you know, kind of they deserve that right to get those disputed. We'll do it through Experian or you, you can do it through um, your side, as I think you do as part of your casework um but getting them removed because ultimately i think what we what we all want in this scenario is a victim of um modern slavery and economic abuse to come out the other end with a clear credit record so that they can then access the things that you spoke about like a mobile phone contract or just a basic bank account with um with no problem at all so they can start rebuilding their lives i guess yeah super Absolutely. um yeah. so We've kind of talked about some of the support that we can um, give people, but if we talked about some of the scenarios where um, I don't know where you might be working in a company and might see something that's a bit suspicious, but what if you're just a member of the public and you think something is suspicious? Is there anything that people should do in that scenario? So if they think um, they uh, I mean, we've seen some of the bits on the news about, you know, looking out for certain characteristics of um, of businesses and so on that maybe we should be a bit suspicious of. But do you offer any advice around that in terms of, you know, how we uh, report anything or do that? Is that, again, kind of the 101 calls or using your website to find the right resources? Yeah, I think as an individual, you obviously want to be aware of your own safety and you don't want to be sort of going into intervening in something because you, you just don't know kind of, you know, it's part of an organised crime group or what, you know, could could happen as a result of that. Um, so if it appears, um, you know, that you, you see people who maybe, it depends on the type of industry, I guess, that you're within, but for example, having like accommodation on site um, of maybe, I don't know, a shop or a car wash. Um, maybe if it looks like, um, you know, people aren't speaking English, if it appears that um, maybe people look sort of malnourished or they, you know, they have any, any sort of physical injuries or they appear like fearful of the people around them. Um, these are just some of the indicators to, to look out for and, and be aware of, but definitely look at sort of the full list on, on the website. Um, 
but it would be a case of yeah just if there are any suspicions there's no harm in reporting it because it might build up a bigger picture um you know what what you see might just be one part of the puzzle um and so yeah definitely i think it, the, the same contact that i gave earlier would be the same you know if it was a business or an individual um but i'd say if you suspect something there's just no harm in you know passing that information on excellent that's great so we've kind of wrapped up most of the questions that we had um to cover but i think you know from from um from our perspective, I mean, the, the team that you and the team at Hope for Justice are doing some great work, I think, to support victims. And I think, you know, quite rightly, you know, experience a credit reference agency has a role to play in supporting victims of economic abuse. You know, we've talked about making sure we could get credit reports to you guys so you can do a financial assessment and then dispute all the fraudulent information on someone's account, which I think is really important because, you know, I, I mean, we, we have to work. Um, to support these victims and make sure that they can rebuild their lives afterwards. So, you know, from our perspective, I think it's great to work together and it's really good that you've taken us through the journey of um, modern slavery, which I think is a bit of an eye opener for a lot of people. So, you know, from our perspective, thanks. Uh, and thanks, Laura, for coming on to talk to us about it. It's, it's been um, it's been really great to hear, although, you know, kind of distressing and a bit scary. But I think, you know, it's good to understand the real problems that I think people and modern slaves face. Absolutely. Yeah. No, thank you to Experian for all your support to Hope for Justice and for developing this system, because I think it means that um, now we've got a much clearer position on, you know, what debt and loans and um, kind of fraud has taken place on the person's account, which just really um, speeds up their recovery because they can deal with that straight away. Then that's not something sort of hanging over them. Um, and then also as a kind of extra safety precaution, I know we can put passwords on accounts so that if someone tries to open, a, you know, an account or, you know, open, take a, a loan in the person's name, they will be asked for their passport password, which then enables, um, you know, that kind of extra safety feature to prevent re-exploitation. Um, so, yeah, yes. really good service that, that you're able to offer and, and is really making a difference. So thank you. Super. And that was a good last minute reminder that um, to talk about that. But you did. So, yes, anyone who is a victim, I mean, actually, for anyone who's a victim of fraud um, uh, and, you know, economic abuse can put this password on their report, which means that, you know, you could put a, a password on when you apply for credit. The lenders will look at this password and should ask for this password when you apply. So only you should know this password, which means it's an extra level of protection, which again is is um, is free to do for anyone who wants to and who's kind of concerned about that situation. So usually when you have been a victim already, um, you can add that. So thanks for the um, prompt <laughs> and reminder. But yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, thanks for um, for coming on today. Really appreciate it. It's been great. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.